Oh, it's just like, are you I don't know what I
these allow the viruses are usually more specific for a tissue because they have proteins on the outside that will then match to a receptor on different cells. Uh, so this is why these tend to be more respiratory uh, viruses. Uh, and I believe they're all RNA viruses. Okay, so how do they work? How do viruses infect you? Oh, they inject, uh, they inject uh, what's the word, DNA or RNA and have your cell mechanic uh, mechanisms to build the proteins that go so for reproduction of the virus. Pretty close. Um, so they, they're very good at getting in a cell. And once they get in, they are embraced, they move into uh, the nucleus or into the cytoplasm, and they take over the, the mechanism of the cell, and they you then those cells become just factories uh, for producing the, the virus. So how do we stop them? Okay, so we produce systemic, systemic symptoms that will help. So fever will do that. What else do we do? Destroy it. Destroy it. How? So our immune system uh, will recognize them and uh, will eventually tag them and will phagocytize them and get rid of them. Uh, why do we get symptoms from them? Do they, they cause the symptoms? The symptoms related to them are, due, are caused by what? The immune response. Okay. Good. All right. Um, let's see. I have a video, but I, I don't know if I can get it to play from here. Does that sound? Uh, yes. Why not? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> are really good and the explanation is, um, is also well done. Okay. Okay, here we tell me what you see the difference between those two pictures. The mm -hmm. constriction on the brown. Mucus. Mucus. Oh. What else do you see? Constriction. Okay, so constriction meaning uh, the lumen is smaller. What else do you see? The, the muscles are constricted with like hypertrophy. This is a more chronic case. We'll see this in asthma that that muscle layer hypertrophies gets a lot bigger, so it's very responsive when you hit it with um, catecholamines. And then when we use drugs, we're going to use that to, uh, to decrease that. So what does this lead to? What do you hear when you're listening to that person and they come in? Uh, wheezes, perhaps. What else? Crackling. Not crackles. Wrong kind. Did you talk about bronchi? Bronchi are, tend to be in those bigger uh, airways. And so what does a bronchi sound like? Can we listen? Have you heard that? Uh, Professor Husing would correct me, but to me they're very sonorous. You're talking about a bigger vessel, so the air is deeper. Have you ever blown into a, a glass bottle, Coke yeah. bottle? You know what those are, right? <laughs> okay. So if you blow into it, you get a deep sound, don't you? <laughs> It's kind of like you sit there and you meditate, it's that big hum, it feels like your chest. That's those larger, 
vessels. Wheezes tend to be much higher pitched. They come from those smaller, especially when you get out to bronchioles, you get that wheezing very high, high pitch, usually at the end of expiration. Um, okay, good. Well, let's see, anything else? Cough. So they're going to come in mostly for or probably for the cough annoying. What did you learn about the cough associated with bronchitis? It's meant to happen. Okay, so it's it's uh, the body uses it to try to get rid of stuff. What else? Okay, so usually it's not productive, and we by that we mean what? Okay. Uh, and length of time. Do they come in the day after it happens? No. About what? Yeah. Okay, so definitions at least five days. Does it go away within a week? No. So how long does it last? Can last can last a couple of weeks. That's the annoying part of it. In people, we'll see with asthma when you put a viral uh, get a viral infection in those airways. Those airways can stay hyper uh, sensitive for up to eight weeks. So it takes a long time for those airways to to uh, come back to to normal. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, so no constitutional signs, but so no fever. What about lab? Any difference in lab? You can have a high white count with, with a bronchitis? Probably not. Probably be normal. Usually their lab is normal. Would you normally draw a lab on a person with bronchitis? No. How are you going to diagnose them? You're going to get a chest x-ray on everybody with bronchitis? No. Listen. History. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. So goals of therapy, it's self-limited, so mostly it's supportive. Uh, so that's uh, keeping them hydrated uh, is, is really important. Also keeping the viscosity of those, uh, of that uh, mucus down. That's best done with water, uh, fluids. Uh, also, a, de a humidifier would be helpful, uh, could also help. Uh, can use uh, the different analgesics and antipyretics. They're listed there. You have seen them before. It's the same information, same dosing for children and for adults. Uh, so the aspirin is, can certainly be used. A lot of people don't use it because it's hard on their stomach, and so they may use Tylenol. They may use uh, an NSAID. So the Tylenol, the most important thing about Tylenol is what? In terms of advising people about dosing. It's that max dose. So three, four if they're very healthy, no, no problems. But for most, it's a maximum of three a day to, to reduce the risk of liver damage. Ibuprofen is, uh, any of the insets could be used. That's one that I have given you before to know dosing. So you, you've seen these before. So go back through them. Your brain's been over them at least twice. Uh, so a third time won't hurt and uh, review those. So 200 to 800 milligrams every four to six hours. The over-the-counter brand uh, strength is 200. So above that, you'd have to go to a prescription. Keep these in mind because people will self-medicate. They may self-medicate before they get to you. So you need to kind of know what kinds of things are out there and available so that you can ask. Have you taken anything for pain? Yes. I don't remember the name of it. So you can use things to prompt them. <coughs> What'd you buy? I bought Motrin. Well, how, what are you, how much are you taking? Well, I don't know. What strength is it? Well, you already know what strength it is. Okay? So those things are helpful. All right. Cough and cold. So let's talk about cough suppressants because they may use that quite a bit before they come to see you. Um, there's no, there's nothing to support routine use of, of cough, cough suppressants. Uh, but for comfort-wise, I mean, it doesn't de it doesn't change the cough. It doesn't change the course of the disease. It doesn't um, uh, shorten it. It's only going to make them feel better. 
Um, so the ones that are mostly used are on the next page, and that is uh, the anti-tussers. Uh, let me go back and pick up some things. Often those cough suppressants are in uh, multiple ingredient products, so they may also have an antihistamine in them. We really like to stay away from antihistamines with cough because they tend to be dry and they tend to have a lot of side effects. Uh, but sometimes, but they are effective cough suppressants, but they can also aggravate the cough. Uh, they also may have decongestants in them. Decongestants can aggravate a cough because they decongest, so stuff drips down their throat, so that can aggravate. You know how I feel about multiple ingredient products. I don't like them. Pick the, pick the symptom that the person has and match the drug with it. Don't like multiple uh, ingredients because people also then tend to use multiple products and they can get too much of, of a, um, a class of drugs. So some things that they could uh, also consider using are on the top of page three. Throat lozenges I'll go through just so you kind of know uh, what's in them. Uh, there's different uh, ingredients and there is a huge number of them out on the market so lots of things to uh, to choose from. Hot tea, honey, all of those are soothing so they decrease the irritation that can lead to cough. Avoid smoking. If they're a smoker or if they're uh, exposed to smoke, that's really an aggravating um, uh, outside source. So the antitussives that are approved are dextromethorphan, diphenhydramine. What do you remember about di diphenhydramine? What is it? What kind of drug? It's Benadryl. It's, it's a first generation antihistamine. It crosses the blood brain barrier, so it has all those central side effects that we've talked about. Um, and then dextromethorphan, Robitussin is the kind of the, is the uh, brand name that most people know. Codeine is also a very good antitussive, but because of the uh, abuse potential, uh, in problems, they took that uh, the codeine uh, elixir or solution off the market about a year or so ago. Uh, the codeine's a really good uh, antitussin, but there's no longer a cough syrup with uh, codeine uh, available. So let's talk about dextromethorphan. Very interesting drug. Uh, it is a, an opiate derivative. Uh, it's, uh, it works centrally. It uh, decreases the, uh, the uh, cough center in the medulla, uh, so you feel less likely to cough when you, when you take it. Uh, it's indicated for a non-productive cough. Uh, it comes in a plethora of dosage forms. So you can get it in a syrup, gels, liquids. Uh, some of the cough uh, uh, Cough drops also have dextromethorphan, so you want to warn patients about don't use the liquid and use one or the other. Uh, if you're going to use cough drops that contain dextromethorphan, don't double up. There's extended release uh, suspensions, extended release syrups, Delsum is the one on the market. Um, and it does have a max dose. At high doses, it can cause problems. I'll go through that here in just a minute. The big contraindication is not to use it with, um, within two weeks of an MAOI inhibitor. So this is one of those things, if you had to guess and you had no idea what the big contraindication was, go with an MAOI inhibitor, because we've talked about it now multiple times, even in your short time here in the program. Okay, warnings and precautions. This drug has effects on serotonin receptors. So if a person is using it with other drugs that have also serotonergic properties, then you can, uh, through multiple sources, then uh, the person could develop a serotonin syndrome. That syndrome is life-threatening, can be life-threatening. Uh, so we just want to warn people, especially if they're on uh, antidepressants that are serotonergic. Tramadol is a serotonergic drug we've talked about, and now this one. Uh, so that is one to keep in mind that it does have serotonin properties. The other uh, bullet under warnings and precautions really important is uh, children. So several years ago the FDA started cleaning house and saying okay if you don't have um, 
um, if you if your drug came in before it had to show efficacy or safety, we're going to start cleaning house. And one of the things they did was with cough and cold products in children. Okay, so and so this one came under uh, scrutiny because it has caused problems in kids, uh, lethal uh, problems. So. Uh, dextromethorphan is not recommended in kids uh, at four and under. That's, that's an important one to keep in mind. Never use it in babies. Uh, some of them have benzyl alcohol in it, which is a real problem in, in infants, young uh, infants. So adverse reactions. So it has central nervous system activity. It works in the medulla, so it can affect the brain. Drowsiness, nausea, constipation. People take it, they may have trouble operating um, a vehicle. I did this one time when I was in pharmacy school, I had terrible, um, terrible cough, took um, dextromethorphan, almost got myself in a wreck, and then I'm sitting there thinking, you know better, you know better. Uh, but I still did it. Uh, so drowsiness uh, is a big one. Uh, higher doses can cause a, uh, a change in mental status, confusion, uh, excitement, irritability, nervousness, serotonin syndrome we talked about. Those uh, are symptoms of serotonin uh, syndrome. Potential for abuse. So this drug at very high doses is hallucinogenic. Uh, it can give you out of body experience. Uh, so when you're getting about to 100 milligrams in a dose, uh, that's when those symptoms can start. People take them all the way up into like 600 milligrams, and they're, they, uh, they are lethal uh, also. So robo-tripping, robos, uh, robo-fizzing, robo-dosing, dexing, skittling, uh, because the, the, um, the tablets are colored like skittles, different tablets. So skittling, these are all slang terms. This is a, uh, has been in the past a common drug for adolescents uh, with, with uh, education. The use has gone down, uh, but it can cause death, brain damage, seizures, loss of consciousness. Uh, so not a good one to, uh, to overuse. <coughs> Questions about that? Yes. Uh, and more, I think we're going to let some girl kill ourselves using really? culture. Mm -hmm. How much do you have to ingest before you actually? Well, it, there isn't there isn't a, a lethal dose that I can tell you as always. But I when I read about it, it's, it's in the 100 is where these words will start. 600 people have taken as that as much, uh, but the lethal amount I don't know. Also. Keep in mind often that, that overdoses are rarely single agents. So it could have been other agents she took it with as well, okay. or other medications she was on. Okay. So some are in that range. So a lot. A lot. Okay. Yes, it is a lot. <laughs> Mechanism of cough, I've just put it there for uh, just to kind of outline uh, at least the uh, the peripheral irritation and then the involvement of the medulla and the impulses that lead uh, the parasympathetic uh, system and then the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, the lungs. So it's a lot of, it's a fairly complex uh, response. And our drugs are going to, topically, we're going to try to decrease those initial symptoms, the, those mechanic or uh, chemo receptors, uh, and then with the other drugs that are centrally acting, that's uh, like with dextromethorphan, we're going to try to get that. So diphenhydramine, again, can be used for cough, uh, does decrease, it increases the cough threshold, so it works differently from dextromethorphan. Uh, also indicated for a non-productive cough, but really not considered first line. Uh, because of its side effect potential, because of an elderly, we don't use it because what? what? Uh, falls beers list, so it increases the risk of dementia in elderly. Uh, and we don't use it in children under two because of what? Remember? 
It is, but children under two have a different response. Do you remember? They have an opposite. They have an opposite. So they have a paradoxical CNS stimulation. Uh, so we avoid it in, in uh, that age group. So let's talk about topical products or cough drops, because you may suggest to somebody, well, get a cough drop. Well, cough drops are really different. Uh, so these are considered topical. Uh, they've been around a long time. Uh, I thought this was really interesting. Frog in your throat? This was uh, one of the first uh, groups that patented uh, a product. Uh, this is where the term lozenge comes from is because this was the shape of their product. Can you see that, yeah. the frog? <clears throat> so a lozenge is a French, is a derivation of a French word meaning uh, diamond shape. Uh, and so they took that and put their little stamp on it. Uh, and that was the, the first, one of the first products that came out. They capitalized on that frog in the throat. I thought this was interesting that they put, can you see where I'm pointing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at that. What does it say? Can you read it? Where have you heard that before? Food and Drug Act 1906. What was that? What do you remember? First lecture I ever gave you. Okay. She's, Bethany's right. So this is where they had to they had to list dangerous substances. Okay, that was one thing. What else did they have to do? They didn't have to show efficacy. This was the one, this was like the first Consumer Protection Act. So they came in and they said, you got to put down what's in the drug. Okay? So you see up here what they've done. They've listed it. It's right here. Cubids, uh, uh, Tulu, licorice, whorehound, wild cherry, all herbs. So they put down their, their list, there, there were no uh, dangerous, they didn't meet any of the dangerous list products. Um, so I thought that was really interesting that they put that on there. Um, I don't know if that was required at that time that you had to use that verbiage or not, but I thought, you've heard of that, so now you see it in, in action. All right, so lozenge, trochee, pastille, all of those mean the same word, uh, same thing, refer to a, a lozenge. Uh, the first ones were heart, more heart candy. A lot of them still have sugar in it. Heart candy works, uh, usually because it'll stimulate saliva and coat your uh, throat with it. Uh, but they contain, if you look, there's topical anesthetics, there's demulsants and antitussives. So those are kind of the three big areas um, of, of um, products. I want you to be able to at least, if I gave you a, a, a product and said, okay, here's what's in it, you could tell me what it is. So topical anesthetics, these block the, the nerve uh, impulses. Uh, benzocaine and di diclinine are the two main ones that you will find in most products. They should not be used in children uh, because the benzocaine at higher levels increases the, re the risk of methemoglobinemia uh, in kids and can be fatal. So if you're familiar with the Sepacol products, they've been around a long time, they use benzocaine, uh, whereas Sucrets uh, uses uh, diglipine uh, as its um, anesthetic. And often these products will have multiple. Uh, they'll use multiple uh, ingredients. Demulsants um, are a coating. Uh, it, demulsants, I looked at the origin of the word and it is Latin from a Latin word meaning to caress. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, so it covers the, the throat, covers mucous membranes, kind of sticks to it, and just protects it. Uh, you will often see me bring them down here. If I have to talk a lot, especially in the winter time, dries out my airway and it'll make me cough. So I, I carry Ludens. They're my favorite. They're like candy. They are. I used to pretend to be sick when I was like so that. Good. So you could get them. Yeah. yeah. The problem is, is that they have calories in them uh, a lot. So you have to be careful. Uh, but they do make sugar free as well. So pectin, that's the thing we put into jellies and jams. If you make jelly ever, you use pectin to uh, kind of gel it up and firm it up. 
Uh, the effects are short-lived, though. They don't last very long, uh, so that's the only downside of them. Other um, domulsants would be honey. And you'll see a lot of these uh, products will be flavored with honey. But it's another thing, at least for kids over the year, age of one, you can use honey. Why do we not use honey and or advise honey in kids under one? Botulinum. So don't give it to kids under one. Glycerin would be another. So those are the common domulsants that we use. So hot tea with honey in it makes sense. Um, Antitussives, dextromethorphan can be in these, these products. Uh, you already know it as a, from what we've talked about before. The other two that are approved as topical are camphor and menthol. So camphor and menthol have some uh, anesthetic, topical anesthetic products. They're also counter irritants. We talked about counter irritants mm -hmm. before. What did I tell you? They kind of trick. They they cause an irritant or a sensation in one part of the brain, distant from the other, and it makes it's kind of like you can only think about one thing at one time. So you think about that instead of the uh, the pain in the other area of the discomfort. Uh, Vicks Vapo Rub is camphor. I usually don't like to because they. I mean, you can smell it on somebody's breath. It's so aromatic. Um, but Vicks Vapo Rub, uh, Vicks Vapo Steam, used in a um, how do you call those things? Yeah, human fire, yes. Menthol, uh, another one uh, from the mint oils, different products. Uh, we can either synthesize it or we can get it from those. Uh, like peppermint oil, it's a derivative. So also it's local anesthetic and counter irritant properties. Hall's menthol drops, they'll usually include, they often include those in the, in the name. So those are the three big areas. You will also find ones with zinc in them. So there was a craze for a while that zinc with vitamin C decreased the cold. Um, very little evidence that it has much, any, if any pharmacologic property. It may have some ability to decrease the binding of viruses to cells, but it's weak. Um, so it may decrease a cold or, a, or a, a symptoms by a day probably won't hurt you, um, so that would be where it is. The coldies are really about the only ones that have uh, zinc in them still, that I can find. Still there. Why do they affect your taste buds when you just Oh, they're terrible. I, like yeah, terrible taste, and I think that's why it probably they went away. Uh, they coat, they just sit on it. Ah, so, so it's like for an hour or two after. Yeah, they're terrible. Yeah. So that, I think, keeps most people from, from using it. Okay, so that's, those are cough drops. So what I would say is if you were going to recommend somebody get a cough drop is tell them to go to the pharmacist. Maybe not at Walmart because they're very busy, but in a slower pharmacy, they can take them out there and show them. Because if you go over and look at all the, the different products, it probably doesn't matter. They'll all be effective to some degree. Uh, but... That's usually what I do, is I write it on my discharge, here's what I want you to do, take it to the pharmacist, tell them here's what I'm looking for. Or if you have a brand, you can tell them to do that. Is there a certain brand you would never recommend that they need to be doing? Not really, no, the ones that are out there are, uh, I like that Fisherman's Friend. I just like the name, I think it's so cool. <laughs> I just think the name is cool, I think, you know. But any of these will, will help. Okay. For the most for the rest of these, it's pretty easy. They're not recommended. This is the big this is probably the one lecture I give where I tell you not to use, what not to use. Uh, eucalyptus. I know you've probably heard people say, yeah, I prescribe eucalyptus. I'm just telling you, they are not worth the money. They're expensive and they don't work. For the most part, they're not that effective for the cost. Is this just for bronchitis yeah. in general? That is my opinion okay. based on what I have read. Other people tell you to use it in their area, listen to them, but I'm just telling you overall, mucolytics have very, very weak evidence, if any, that they work, that they do it. Uh, when we get to COPD, I'll talk about it quite a bit because that's a big problem in, with COPDers. Um, 
The biggest thing is water helps. Well hydrated and using humidified air usually are your, your better uh, approaches. Use of inhaled beta agonists. No support in literature. You will see it used, but there really isn't anything that says that it changes outcomes. Um, same for corticosteroids. Again, this is a common thing that people like to give. We kind of toss around short doses of corticosteroids like they were nothing, but they are something. Uh, and so don't use them if you, unless the person is a higher risk because of other underlying pulmonary disease. But in general practice, there's really no reason to, to use them. Routine uh, use of antibiotics. Don't use them. They're, it's viral. What, are the, what is the organism that might be more likely to be ca causing a prolonged cough? Two, uh, two different ones. RSV, bronchiolitis. So did you talk about pertussis? No. Mycoplasma? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> those chronic coughs, long coughs, those you need to think about pertussis and uh, mycoplasma. We'll probably hit those at a different time. Um, the last lecturer said that if the cough lasts for longer than like 10 days, he might go ahead and give them some antibiotics. What do you think about that? Like yeah, he, he's like, it normally goes away within like five to seven, but if it, after ten, they still have it. Yeah. Go ahead and get it but what do they have? I think it goes to the person. What are their underlying disease? What's their un underlying uh, uh, immune status? What's their age? What are their risk factors? So I think you have to take into account more than just that. Um, did uh, Scott talk about the progression of, of this to pneumonia percentage? Okay, page six, chronic, acute bronchitis in kids. This is another where it is pretty much supportive care. Uh, again, the analgesics you have seen before, you should know these doses for the Motrin and the Tylenol. I told you you'd see it over and over again. This is the third time I put this table in a handout. Uh, so go over it again. Refresh your, your memory about the, the Tylenol, which is 10 to 15 milligrams per kilo per dose, and the maximum, maximum number of doses in a 24-hour period. For the Motrin, it is, um, there's a max dose per day. <coughs> And it's four to ten milligrams per kilogram every six to eight hours. Just to go back over those. Uh, dextromethorphan, we recommend not using in kids. We have said before. Uh, the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, I tend to go back and look at their recommendations. Uh, they recommend, again, not under four. Uh, they are really anti using cough and cold remedies in kids. Mm -hmm because of lack of evidence, and so the, the risk outweighs the benefit uh, is, is their uh, stance. So what alternatives do you have for kids? Uh, because they can be uncomfortable and cranky and they can make your life more difficult uh, because, you're, you're, because you don't want them to be uncomfortable. Uh, so honey, again, the age, honey can be used. Uh, increased humidification. Uh, the last two things I put are more directed at is there a cause, is there a reason. If they have post-nasal drip, then an antihistamine to dry them up would be appropriate. Uh, GERD, if they have reflux and that is causing a cough, can cause a chronic cough, then treating the GERD. So it's, it's uh, more to say look for a reason. If there's a reason, treat the underlying reason. Otherwise you're just treating a symptom and you're not going after the cause. So 
I I don't um, I, I don't have a lot of comment except to say there's not there's just not a lot of data. So I, I tend to be a evidence based person. So I don't really support them. Uh, views. Um, okay, bronchiolitis in kids. Goal of treatment, oxygenation, uh, hydration is, is important, and if there's a fever, using analgesics for that. For non-severe bronchiolitis, it's mostly analgesics, but again, it shows no proven, uh, I'm sorry, the antipyretics, but then avoiding the OTC decongestants and cough medicine. So that's the dextromethorphan, diphenhydramine. Fluid intake is probably the most important. So if they're tachypnic or if they are um, having some trouble breathing, if they don't feel well it, and, they're, and they're feverish, then their, their use of, of uh, or their hydration status will deteriorate more often. If you're breathing faster, you're breathing out more moisture. And so it's important for them to keep up with that. In more severe, uh, the primary treatment comes down to fluid management and respiratory support. I don't have a lot to offer here. I added this more for a complete list, complete sake. So looking at oral versus parenteral fluids. So if they can't take down enough oral, you're going to get the, the fluids parenterally. The other would be respiratory support. So suctioning, nasal suctioning uh, would be the first line, supplemental oxygen. Uh, using the uh, then the, the uh, high flow nasal cannula delivery of oxygen or CPAP that would be to avoid trying to avoid having to intubate them and then intubation being the last uh, step. So medications, um, bronchodilators and um, and corticosteroids would be the two to look at. So the American Academy of Pediatrics comes out and says they really discourage the bronchodilators because uh, they do not change uh, outcome. So when I, I say that term a lot, I throw it out, what do I mean by that? If I'm saying it doesn't change outcome, what does that mean? Short and reduced days. Done, done uh, what did you say, did, doesn't improve the course? Doesn't shorten the course. Doesn't shorten the course. So what would the outcomes be? Okay, what else? So did you have to hospitalize them? Okay. Did, how long did they have to stay hospitalized? That would be another. Um, no improvement in oxygen saturation. So those are outcomes. They're looking at, at things that they can measure. So outcomes are usually measurable. Uh, so it's important to look at those because if it doesn't change those things, then, then they're, they're saying there isn't any reason to give them. Okay. So they don't, so look at what they say. They do not recommend the routine use. So there are some kids who are going to need it and will improve. And if they do, then you've got an indication. Uh, but to just slap it on everybody, there's probably not reason to do that. Now, if you've got a kid that comes in that's got asthma, that's different. Underlying pulmonary disease, that, those are different. Um, um, I saw, at, I didn't see um, Scott Interwitz's uh, stuff from today, but I looked at what he had done last year, and he, um, he put down the albuterol. And he gave you those minimum and maximum doses. Do you do that again this year? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if he can just Usually two and a half to five milligrams. He does it. And you're going to give it via uh, nebulization usually. Uh, or you can use a, uh, and on the next page I've shown you, that little boy at the top of the page is getting it via nebulization. Uh, I know we haven't talked about spacer devices yet, but uh, underneath, uh, that is using an inhaler, an inhaler that is attached to a spacer device if they are in uh, mild distress and can breathe in and out, get enough uptake, updraft, uh, then you can use a, an inhaler with a spacer. So you actuate the drug into that volume, that space, 
and then the child breathes on the other end. Uh, so it decreases technique. You don't have to worry about so much technique in, in terms of getting the drug uh, into the person. Remember I told you the other day when you actuated an inhaler, and you get, you get that cone effect, and, the, and you get big drops. Okay. So when you attach it then to a spacer device, there's the kid. <laughs> <laughs> so in the spacer, the same thing happens. The big stuff drops out. And so by the time the, the child is creating a vacuum to, or a, an air draw to go that way, it's the small stuff that's, that's going along with it. So usually this helps to filter that, that out. Remember we talked about in um, um, brush, uh, you've got the, the steroids depositing in the mouth because of the big, these big ones. And why we use a spacer? Well, that's why, because the big particles just fall out with gravity. And so the smaller ones usually are the ones that are going to get down into the lungs and create uh, an effect. The effect that you want. Okay, so those are the two ways you could deliver it. So not routine use in everybody, but for those children that you think would benefit, uh, it may be appropriate. Steroids, don't recommend the routine use of steroids either. Uh, I know in his... Um, his uh, PowerPoint last year, he said, no evidence that it does any good, but everybody uses it. Okay. Does it have to mean you do that? Because it doesn't, it doesn't, all, it, there's no evidence that it, that it changes outcomes. So no reduction in hospitalization rate, uh, no decrease in hospital stay, clinical scores, or readmission rates. Now, children with underlying pulmonary disease are a different story. Uh, did you talk about hypertonic saline? Yeah. Three percent? Yeah. We barely touched on it. said like a sentence about it. Okay. So, what's the tonicity of, of mucus? What would it be? So, the tonicity of, of mucus would be. 0.9%. So what, why would you use a hypertonic? What would a hypertonic saline do? So which way is fluid going to go? It's going to go to the higher concentration, right? So it's going to draw that fluid out. Uh, so it may help. Uh, so it's something that you could consider. It says the, a the AAP guidelines indicate to use it, uh, may be used in children with bronchiolitis. So there's really, mostly it's supportive care, it's, res it's supporting their um, oxygenation, supporting their hydration are the two big things. And the things that we've commonly done don't really have a lot of evidence for widespread use in every child, but maybe some children would benefit. Unproven uh, therapies, antibiotics, don't routinely use. Ribavirin doesn't, um, that has fallen out of favor. Leukotriene modifiers have been used. Um, they have very small uh, studies and uh, groups to support some use. So it wouldn't be something you'd recommend across the board. Uh, Prevention of RSV, did you talk about Synegus? Yes. Did he tell you he loved that drug? He called that P-drug. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's the M-A-V. Okay. So it is a monoclonal antibody. If you, anytime you see at the end of a drug name, MAB, M-A-B, that is a monoclonal antibody. So what we have done is we've taken uh, and we have in, in, injected into usually mice uh, an antigen and we're trying to get them to produce antibodies that we want. And they will. And they'll produce them all day long. 
Then we take them, because if we then turn around and inject those into a human, your body would see it as uh, foreign and destroy them. So what we do is we humanize them. We make them look more like what a human uh, antibody would look like. Uh, and that's why it's called a humanized monoclonal antibody. And these are against those, uh, those glycoproteins that allow the, the cells, or allow those viruses to attach to a cell. That's why I showed them to you before. So this drug ties those up, and so it makes it harder for that RSV or that virus to get into the cell. That's why they're called, that's why they're preventative. They are not for everyone. Uh, if you look on the next page, these are the major recommendations for prophylaxis. So the big thing to keep in mind is it's prophylaxis, it's preventative. Preventive. Who's, who is most likely to benefit? Kids that are born premature, ones that have underlying uh, pulmonary disease or cardiovascular disease. So those are the big ones. Uh, you do not have to memorize these. I want you to kind of look through and get a, a feel for that. Uh, it has to be started before RSV season. From what I've read, it that starts in November. Uh, I don't know if that's true in all places in the United States. Uh, so you start it before and you continue it for five months. So that's where some of the problem comes is that you've got to have, they've got to come back every month and, and get a, a dose. They're very well tolerated. You can give them around their immunization schedule. So they're, they're fairly easily, it's a fairly, uh, not a difficult drug for uh, kids to get, but has some logistic problems around it. And it's very expensive. Is it a shot? It is. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. All right. We're going to finish up the last two pages, then we'll take a we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and look at the uh, prescriptions. A crew. So with croup, there's a couple, two things. We're going to look at a bronchodilator and steroids. So here, in this situation, you do have uh, evidence for these two agents to be used. Um, so with, um, in terms of the steroid, dexamethasone has been the one that has been preferred. Uh, it's very long acting. They give it once, and that's it. So they give it in the emergency room or, or wherever the urgent care. And because of its long activity, Leave with a one time dose. If you look down there, the dose is 0.6 milligrams per kilo. The range is varied. I found anywhere from 10 to 20 as 20 milligrams as the maximum dose, uh, with about an average recommendation of about 16. So realize it does have a maximum dose, it is based on weight. It's given one time. Now, oral dexamethasone tastes terrible. Um, so what, I don't know if he, did Scott talk about using IV, taking it IV and prep and, and mixing it and using it? Okay. So, I'm surprised because he's usually told other classes that. Uh, okay, so what, so the IV product uh, uh, is much more concentrated. So you can use a smaller volume. And so what people in, in uh, uh, emergency rooms have done is they draw out the IV, they mix it with a sweetener, and they give it to the kid. Okay. As a pharmacist, I can tell you don't ever, ever, ever do that. <laughs> don't. Unless you talk to a pharmacist who says, yes, you can do that. Here's what it's compatible with. I will be happy to make that for you and give it back to you. Don't take drugs that are intended for one way and give them a different way, unless you check. Always check with somebody. If you don't have a pharmacist on your site, if you call the company, they can tell you. Sometimes they'll tell you and sometimes they'll say we don't have evidence. The other thing you could do is call a compounding pharmacy. They will probably know more than anybody if you don't have a pharmacist on site, because your pharmacist on site can look those things up. Always, always check. Never distort a dosage form for your own use to give to a patient. 
you just don't know if you're if you are manipulating it in a way that will still maintain its efficacy and its release characteristics. Okay. So I went back to look because this tends to be a common practice and see if there was any data. And there was. Uh, there was a group of Canadian pharmacists who who looked at stability of this product when mixed with different vehicles. And so they used two different uh, vehicles. They used a um, Oral sweet. Mm -hmm. Oral sweet, it's a just a syrup vehicle uh, flavored, and they mixed it and found that it just did uh, remain stable. Uh, the other thing is they used a, a suspending agent, and they found in both of those that the drug stayed stable up to 90 days. Now that doesn't mean you mix it up in the ER and keep it, but it tells you that if it stay if it maintains stability that long, then probably. If you give it to the kid, it will work. But unless you're doing sampling, if you know, or you're doing some kind of, of uh, evaluation that says the, the kid got better or measurements, you really don't know. That's why I'm saying don't ever do that unless you have information that says um, that that's okay. And with kids, there's a lot. Of, your pediatric pharmacists are going to be your best because they have to make a dosage uh, or ways to give kids uh, medicine all the time. So there's a lots of data in the pediatric literature about how to do that safely so that whatever you're wanting to accomplish will get done and not, not, not harm the kid or inactivate the drug. Okay, yes? Is it different because you're mixing it compared to like uh, the chocolate chaser? Just because you're taking it and then you're taking the chocolate chaser, does it make a difference? to the medication or the drug, and this one you're saying because you mix it, you don't know if it's still... Well, the drug was formulated and intended to be put into a vein, not to be okay. put in the stomach. So when you put it into the stomach, then you've got acid, you have all kinds of enzymes that will work against you. Um, so it's, it's a whole different environment that you're putting it into. That's the difference. Plus, some of those, uh, in, those uh, injectables will have benzyl alcohol as their preservative, which is lethal, or not lethal, but is harmful to very young infants, neonates. So you got to look at the preservatives as well. And what else do they add to it? Last thing, epinephrine. So there's, there's two different forms. There's regular epinephrine, and then there is racemic epinephrine. And if you look down at the bottom, I've given you the, the uh, different uh, forms. So those isomers are mirror images. You remember that from chemistry? You hold them up to the mirror and go home and do that. <laughs> you will look the, you'll see the other one in the mirror. Okay. So epinephrine is very effective. Uh, it, it, when you've got an, an airway, and we used to use it all the time when uh, people were in respiratory distress or having asthma attacks, we gave them epinephrine because it will, uh, it will cause a, a, the airways to open very, it's very quick. But it also has lots of side effects because it, uh, it affects alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2 receptors. So it affects the heart, affects the... Uh, the lungs as well, blood pressure, all of that. So more difficult drug to use, more side effects, especially in, in older people, people have underlying uh, heart disease, it can be a problem. So, let's look at how it works. So how does that help us? What does it say next? 
Decreases, how should you say? Decreases or increases? Decreases. Decreases. Why is, why is that important? What happens in that capillary? Capillary is, in, is has yes. action. So here is where fluid can enter or exit, right? Mm -hmm. So usually across the capillary, coming from the arterial, your hydrostatic pressure is high. So it forces fluid out. As you get further down that capillary, as the hydrostatic pressure decreases, then fluid will come in. Okay. So if it's decreasing hydrostatic pressure, how, well, which, which way is the fluid going to go? Yeah. In. So if you've got edema in those areas, then the fluid's going to move into the vascular space and out of the, um, the tissue space. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So that's one thing it does. The other is that it that beta-2 receptors interacting with that will cause bronchodilation. Um, so you get two effects from it, so very effective. So they came up with the racemic mixture because the, the isomers have different effects. So the isomer, if you look at down in, under racemic, uh, you've got the levo and the, the dextro. So it's, it tells you that the levo isomer has the greatest presser effect, so that effect. But it's very short-lived. So when you mix it, when you have a racemic mixture of both isomers, that the other isomer is very, is very um, weak, but it's very long-lived. So the thought was you'll get the effect you want, but it will last longer. Because when you give epinephrine, its effects are short-lived, less than two hours. So you give it to a kid, and two hours later, the symptoms come back. So the hope was with the racemic mixture is that you would get a lot longer effect. Didn't he tell you you need to keep the kid in the emergency room for two hours so that they don't rebound? So in looking at in comparison studies, it doesn't really matter. And the racemic mixture is much more expensive. So you can use either one, um, either the original uh, epinephrine or the racemic mixture. Where's epinephrine made? Adrenal. adrenal. What part of the adrenal? The medulla. Oh, okay. Medulla. Catecholamines come from the medulla. Yeah. What comes from the cortex? That's that it. That's it. So your mineralocorticoids, your glucocorticoids, and your adrenal corticoids. Salt, sugar, sex? Yeah. Salt, sugar, sex. Salt, sugar, sex. Okay. Questions? Okay, so mostly it's what do you not use. Okay. All right. Um, let's take a 10 minute break, come back, and get your, uh, your uh, handout or your uh, assignment, your prescription assignment. We're going to talk about it. Yes. Thank you.